Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, Oceanwide Expeditions webinar about the Antarctic Peninsula. My name is uh, Franklin. I am marketing and sales manager for several years now for, uh, for Oceanwide. And I'm going to give you a short introduction before we begin. First thing, uh, I'm very happy to introduce you to our speaker for today, Sarah Jenner. Sarah has been a guide with us for, for many years and uh, is a passionate polar traveler, but uh, also a brilliant photographer. That's something you will see during the presentation itself. So no better person um, to tell us everything about the Antarctic Peninsula and to make sure you can make a perfect choice when choosing your trip there. Now, uh, I will start with a short introduction. I won't go into too many details, but uh, Oceanwide Expeditions has uh, more than 25 years of experience in, uh, in polar expeditions. Uh, it all started in, in the 90s when, uh, when Oceanwide took over the activities of the Plensius Foundation. One of the most important developments during, uh, during all of these years is the acquisition and the building of our own fleet of vessels. So our own fleet will, means, also means that we have a lot of flexibility and, uh, and year after year uh, building new vessels and increased capacity. Speaking of vessels, I will show you our fleet. I will start with the first vessel. Is, uh, the first one is a sailing vessel. It's the Rembrandt van der Rijn. Magnificent uh, ship with a capacity of 33 passengers. So uh, 16 cabins, all with shower and bathroom, of course. Uh, the Rembrandt only sails in the Arctic, so not in Antarctica. So we really won't uh, elaborate too much on this one. Our next ship is the Plensius. The Plensius, as you can see, is a motor vessel sailing both in the Arctic and in Antarctica and has a capacity of uh, 108 passengers and uh, 52, 52 cabins. Then our third vessel is the Ortelius. Ortelius has the same capacity as the Plensius with uh, 52 cabins for a maximum of 108 passengers. And as you can see on the image, uh, there is a possibility to carry two helicopters on the Ortelius, which is needed for special trips on the Weddell Sea and the Ross Sea. Uh, we will have another webinar about these destinations, so I won't elaborate on this one, but um, it's, it's quite important here. Now, our fourth vessel. The Hondius. The Hondius is a newly built ship. So the, uh, it started sailing last year uh, for the Arctic season, and it has a capacity of maximum 170 passengers. And on the last ship will be the Jansonius. As you can see, very similar to the Hondius, it's actually a sister ship of, uh, of the Hondius that we are building right now. So it's not finished yet. We are actually building it at, at this time uh, and it will be ready for next Antarctic season. So November 21. This is our entire fleet. Rembrandt, Plensius, Ortelius, Hondius and Jansonius. And if you wonder why these names, Plensius, Ortelius, Hondius and Jansonius, they are all famous cartographers. Now, we, uh, as you probably know, we sail in Antarctica, but we also sail in the Arctic. Very briefly, we'll show you some of our main routes. Uh, starting in May, we sail around Svalbard. Svalbard or Spitsbergen, both are used. It's not exactly the same, but that's, again, something for another webinar. Uh, so between May and September, we, start, we sail around Svalbard. Uh, a bit later in the season, from August to September, uh, you can also sail to East Greenland with us. And then the, in the winter, so from August, to, uh, from uh, November to April, sorry, we also sail in Nor Norway, which means we have a year-round program in the, uh, in the Arctic. That's for the Arctic part. At the end, of the, the Arctic season as such. So in September, our ships sail down all the way to Antarctica, and then we will start our Antarctic season. There we also have a lot of different options, obviously. First option, which will be our 
uh, future webinar will be uh, Falklands and South Georgia. It's a combination of Falklands, South Georgia, and the Antarctic Peninsula. Another option would be the Weddell Sea, which is the east side of the peninsula. Here it is, the Weddell Sea. Uh, this trip is very focused on uh, reaching an emperor penguin colony. Another third option is, uh, is quite an, an exceptional one. It's sailing all the way, passing the Ross Sea, all the way to New Zealand, a 33 days trip. At the end of the season, we will sail back to the north and that will then make the Atlantic Odyssey, starting in Antarctica up to the way north. And then, of course, today's team, the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, we have a lot of options uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, as you can see on this map. But I will give the floor to Sarah to give you all the details about this uh, incredible options. Thank you very much, Well, it's a privilege to be talking to you today about the Antarctic region. Obviously, it's a little bit bittersweet as I would usually spend the festive period in Antarctica with my beloved penguins. But it's still great to talk about this product. And what I would say is we have the best product possible, not in terms of Oshuai SA, but in terms of what where we're going, Antarctica. Um, I previously have worked as an agent and have sold hundreds of trips to Antarctica and have worked now several years for Oceanwide on the ships. So I've dealt with lots and lots of people. And what I will say is Antarctica itself never disappoints. It's mother nature at its greatest. Um, I have had disappointed guests as agent, as, um, as a guide, um, but that usually relates to the sheer They didn't like the expedition leader the weather, they didn't have the right trousers, all that sort of stuff. But Antarctica itself never disappoints. So today I want to go through some of the questions I used to get asked a lot as an agent and unfortunately still get asked as, as a guide when people are already on the trips in a hope that maybe you can make the right decision about what trip you're going and go open-minded because if you do, you will have the best trip ever. Um, so let's get start with the question I get asked the most. Is the best time to visit Antarctica? And what I would always say is there isn't a best time, but there is clear differences. And each month is very, very different. Franklin's explained that our season runs from November to March. Um, there's a possibility going forward. This season may change a little bit as we're seeing the environment and weather conditions change in Antarctica. But at the moment, consider November to March as our sailing time. Um, and within that time, there's huge differences. So it really is important that you identify what is important for you to see, what you want to photograph, what you want to experience. Because a trip in December and a trip in February and March are like going to two different continents. Um, it's one of the reasons that it's not a once in a lifetime trip, because actually you can come back a second time and have a completely different experience. So early season, when we first get down there on those first weeks, you know, this is what Antarctica looks like. It's pristine and white. We may be one of the first people to land at some of the sites since the previous summer. Um, so there'll be no footprints. The penguins are slowly coming ashore. They're starting to try and find their colonies. You can see the little markings of red down on the shoreline, which are penguins in this picture. So you spend a lot of time in snowshoes, walking through bright white virgin snow. It's what you imagine Antarctica to look like. As staff, we spend our time digging in a lot of steps and trying to make a path for you and getting waist height in thick snow. Um, so it's really, really beautiful. Again, this shows no marks, no footprints, no guano. I have to say the end of the season looks a bit different. It has a very pink look about it. Um, but at this time of year, it's really pristine. And as a photographer, it makes for great images. Finding these big, bright white backgrounds is really easy um, against our iconic wildlife in Antarctica. As we go on into the month of November, it's happy hour for the penguins. This is when we get a lot of mating, a lot of uh, courtship rituals, which is great to watch. Again, obviously lots of nice clean backgrounds to photograph again. And once they've mated, they've got to build a nest. 
So you'll see a lot of penguin action on the highways, these penguin highways where they come from the ocean up to their colony with stones, with bits of mud, like this Gen 2 penguin, trying to build a nest. So this behavior mostly takes part in November. Again, you can see the colonies are just beginning to form. They're starting to sit on those nests. And as we move through to the end of November, beginning of December, the penguins spend a lot more time on the nest as pairs like this. There will be a lot of swapping as one of them goes out to feed, the other one sits on the nest. So we'll see a lot of nice tender interaction between the males and females. Unfortunately, we also get a lot of predator action. The giant petrels and the skewers love eggs and chicks. Um, so we do see a lot of this behavior as well, unfortunately. And then of course we get our first penguin chicks, which is really exciting. And as guides, I know in the beginning of December, we find it really hard to usually find our first chicks. We're often presented with a colony of maybe over a thousand penguins. Um, and we may just find one or two very small chicks there. Um, and it's really difficult to try and point them out to the guests because obviously the penguin's sitting right on top of them and maybe just lifts up for a few seconds to reveal this cute little one with an egg. Um, and then all of a sudden we may leave Antarctica, go back to Ushuaia, pick up our next guest. And there's literally, we come down five or six days later and there is penguin chicks everywhere. And that's fabulous. Really, really amazing. Really cute interaction like this. But it's not long. By the end of December, January, the chicks are already looking like this. They've already started to move away from their mums. Um, and that's great. They're really, really nice. Really great interaction like this. And then unfortunately those penguin chicks do start molting quite quickly. So this sort of behavior we're looking at for February time. Um, you can see the penguins have beginning to molt and you can see there's less white snow. They're stood on a lot more guano. Um, and Antarctica has a very distinct smell by that sort of time. Um, and unfortunately your clothes are less smelling of it. I know by the time I finish my season, I smell like a penguin and there's no way around it unfortunately. Also, the adults are beginning to molt. So this is what we're seeing in February. A lot of adult penguins, quite quiet, quite reserved, just standing, allowing that feathers to replace for their new coat, ready to enter the water again. But the one thing we do get at the end of the season, which we don't in the middle, because obviously in December and January, we're faced with 24 hour daylight um, and really quite bright, harsh light. So yes, we have beautiful chicks, but photographically it can be quite challenging. But this is what we get in March. We get these beautiful sunsets and sunrises. So actually for landscape, I would definitely recommend either really early or later in the season when we have more soft light to work to our advantage. The other great thing we get at the end of the season is huge amounts of whales. So we have been really lucky in this previous season we had whales on every single trip. Um, Antarctica is the feeding ground for all the big baleen whales. But early season, November, December, those whales are starving. They've come from their breeding grounds and they are desperate for food. So they're too busy eating and they're just trying to put on weight. But by March time, they become very lazy and fat, a bit like us after Christmas dinner. They've had a big buffet and they're just lying on the surface. And this is what we get. This is my zodiac you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the picture. And this is a minke whale that's just come to have a little look at us. And this is classic behavior. And we also get things like humpbacks, spy hopping our boats. They're lazy, they're waiting, they're killing time until they head north again to breed. So they're really curious at the end of the month. We get lovely interaction and this sort of stuff. And of course, we even get this, unfortunately. This is something we see a lot of at the end of season. Sorry if you're a bit squeamish, but yes, the leopard seals know that those penguin chicks have got to enter the water for the first time. And of course, they've never seen a leopard seal. They have no idea it's an apex predator that's gonna take it down. So those penguin chicks that have molted, they carefully enter the water and there is a lot of this action, unfortunately, um, but great to see. And I'm a great fan of leopard seals, so definitely not a bad one. So next question. Oh, sorry, of course, the most important thing, no matter what time of year, we have lots of fun. Um, that's the really important thing, that yes, there is huge differences between what you're gonna see and experience in each month, but fun, that's throughout the season, without a doubt. 
So the next question I'd like to address is which trip should I do and on which ship? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, it just depends what you're looking for. Um, we obviously have the four ships, two slightly bigger than the other two, um, but all which do very similar itineraries and all work in the same principle as much as possible. So let's have a quick look at some of our Antarctic routes. You can see on the peninsula, there is a few landing sites mentioned here. But what I would like to stress is there's just a few named here, but actually well, there's over a hundred sites that we could land you at. And of course, no brochure that any agent or operator gives you can list all those sites. And that's something really important to consider that as expedition leaders, we want to try and give you as much variety as possible. We know it's really important that you try and see the different penguin species. So we will try and get you to a chinstrap colony, somewhere to see a Delis, although that's now becoming more and more challenging on the Antarctic Peninsula as weather warms up. And of course the Gentoos. I know a continental landing is very important for people. This is often the seventh continent. Um, and you want to step sure, not just on an island, but on a continent. I have to say as staff, we always laugh because actually it's like going to Japan and saying you haven't been to Asia or going to England and saying you haven't been to Europe, which may be, may be the case as of January the 1st, but we'll put that aside. Um, but yes, we do try and do a continental landing. We try and do somewhere where we can cruise you around great big towering icebergs. We try and give you a glacial front experience, cruising around those huge carving glaciers, obviously at a safe distance. We'll try and take you to scientific cats, bases, all sorts of things. But what I really want you to bear in mind when you look at those areas is they're just a few names, just a few examples of places that we could take you to. But there's just as many which are never listed, which actually offer much better options. And as expedition leaders, we work really closely with our captains and we really want them to actually try and get the most out of their trip. So obviously a lot of us work very long seasons. So we know what we've seen the previous trip. We know what the landing sites are looking at. And I'm just going to give you one classic example of what happened, that sometimes we have to work outside the box. You may have seen on the media that Antarctica was much warmer than it had ever been. And what did this mean? It meant that those sites up on the north of the peninsula had melted, were very pink stained. The penguins had already molted much earlier than we were expecting. So actually, as early as January last year, on a regular Antarctic Peninsula, the expedition leader took the wild card to power south and actually cross the circle. And actually, we didn't visit a single place that was on the published itinerary. But what we did do was we found untouched, beautiful sites with pristine snow. We still found penguin chicks, very small, which we wouldn't have done further north. We crossed the circle, which was a huge plus and a very unexpected because it was meant to be a regular peninsula trip. And we didn't see lots of other ships, which is important when we're trying to give you a wilderness experience. So all I want you to take away from this is remember, there's a few sites, a few names that pop up in every brochure, but actually there's so many others that can offer you so much more variety. So go open-minded with the names. So let's have a look at what a regular trip looks like. Embarkation usually starts in Ushuaia, which is the very tip of Argentina. And we try and embark the ship at about four o'clock. What I would suggest is that you allow a couple of days in Ushuaia before embarkation. Why do I say this? Because airlines are pretty unreliable. And yes, there's a good chance that you may arrive on time, but there is also a very good chance that your luggage will be held up in Buenos Aires or somewhere else in the world. Almost every single trip I've ever worked in Antarctica, there is at least one unfortunate guest that has not got its luggage. And that's mostly because they've only allowed one night before the trip. And I tell you, buying a whole new suitcase of stuff in Ushuaia, which is almost possible unless you arrive on a Sunday when most shops are shut, um, is very expensive. So really take a couple of days to enjoy Ushuaia. There's plenty to do, plenty to see there. Get your last Wi-Fi fix, if nothing else, for social media. Go into Tierra de Fuego, go and see some beautiful bird life there, do some hiking, take a trip down the Beagle Channel. There's plenty of endemic wildlife there that you're not going to experience on the Antarctic trip in any detail. So lots to see. So have a couple of nights before embarkation. 
As I said, we embark at four. Once you do that, go straight to your cabin, check that your luggage is there. There's no point your luggage getting as far as you Ushuaia if it hasn't made it on the ship. We also work really closely with a rental company which offer great value and really good quality rental equipment. So if you're coming from a country where you're not familiar and don't need all this cold weather outdoor clothing that you might use for winter hiking or skiing or such like, if that stuff doesn't belong in your wardrobe, you don't want to buy it for this 10 day trip, I really recommend going through the hired company. It's really good and the stuff's waiting for you in your cabin on arrival. So once you get aboard, you know your equipment's there, check everything's working and in place and go and explore the ship. There's definitely no time for sleeping because actually as soon as we get on the ship, we start doing the mandatory safety briefings and then it's captain's cocktails. Then we, of course, drop the ropes and head down the Beagle Channel. The Beagle Channel will offer lots of different wildlife like South American sea lions, different bird species that we're not going to see as we head to Drake's Passage. So it's your last opportunity to do some different birding, maybe see some dolphins or get dusky dolphins down the Beagle Channel. I've even had orcas in the Beagle Channel. So really, the adventure starts now. What I would stress is please don't spend too much time bothering about Wi-Fi. We have it on the ship. It's awful. Don't bother. Enjoy Antarctica. Don't spend time on your Kindle playing games inside. Get out on decks and make the most of it. This 10 day trip, 11 day trip will go so quickly. I know how many months, if not years, you often plan for this trip. So really save every minute. And especially in those peak seasons of December, January, we have 24 hour daylight. So there's really no time to sleep. Stay out on deck, make the most of it. We also have an open bridge policy, which is great. I have to say the bridge won't be open when we're mooring in Shwaya or during the Beagle Channel. But for the vast majority of the trip, the bridge will be open and it's a great viewing platform we have lots of observation decks on all of our ships and the bridge officers and captains are really happy to speak to you give you a new insight tell you all about the weather the instruments they're using forecasting all sorts of stuff so this really is a great opportunity it's something you get on bigger cruise ships so get up onto the bridge use that insight that those officers have, chat to them, get onto the outside deck and make sure you travel with binoculars. Please don't come on this trip without binoculars. It's so frustrating when other people can see their first albatross, see orcas in the distance, such like, and you're stood on deck with no bins. So please bring binoculars with you. So as we head off, the next big question we get asked is what will Drake's passage be like? And what I will say is as an agent and as a guide, I have seen a lot of guests have some horrendous straight passages. However, what's one thing that goes with them all, none of them talk about it once they've been to Antarctica. It's a distant memory. However ill you are, however much you don't want any food, how many times you've been sick, you forget Drake's passage. Antarctica's worth it. And it's a rite of passage as well. I personally feel it's the way you have to do Antarctica. As an agent, I did occasionally sell trips where you could fly Drake's passage. For me, it's cheating. These couple of days on the Drake's Passage is a great time to meet your expedition team, have the lectures, get an insight to what you're going to see in Antarctica, and also see lots of other wildlife that we won't see once we get to the icy continent. So what can Drake's Passage look like? Well, on a good day, this is what we call the Drake Lake. These days come every season, we get a few of these days when we can open up all the outside decks beautiful calm and everyone says oh this is a bit disappointed I wanted to see a rough Drake's passage we also get days like this where you can see a lot of mist and fog coming off the water especially when we cross the Antarctic convergence um, and these sort of days are pretty familiar you can see a bit of swell but nothing to worry about and then we do get days like this and this is what we call the Drake quake and you know what it's quite a lot of fun I have to say I don't get seasick so I can enjoy it on these days obviously that all the outside decks are shut for safety. It's really important we get you to Antarctica safely. Um, I just wanna reiterate this because I'm not sure what everyone believes, but sometimes there's some confusion. That if you have an accident and we need to get you off the ship, a helicopter can come and pick you up or a plane can come and pick you up. This is just not the case. If in this sort of weather, you slip down the stairs and break a leg, Unfortunately, we're going to need to take you back to Ushuaia. That's potentially taking two, three days off the trip, which is crucially taking that time off your five or six days in Antarctica. 
So when the expedition staff keep telling you one hand for the ship, we really do mean it, especially in weather conditions like this. And obviously, if your mobility is not great, we advise you to stay in your cabins this time. We can offer food to your cabins if need be. However, if you're like me and you've got good seafaring legs, this is the time to head up onto the bridge. The bridge is nearly always open when the Drake quake looks like this. Um, and it's a great viewing platform to be on deck seven and see waves coming in at eye level. It's fantastic, actually, and really a highlight for those who don't feel get travel sick. Um, but these days are in their minor. And as I said, even if you're unfortunate to get a few hours looking like this, it's a distant memory when you see your first icebergs. And I do promise you that. So what do we do when we cross the Drake? If we have a little bit of choppy weather, what we find is we get a lot more of the big seabirds following us. So we'll get a lot more petrels, a lot more black-browed albatrosses, the wandering albatross, which has a three meter wingspan. Um, so it's a great time for birding. We also often get great sunsets and sunrises on Drake's Passage. And of course we start seeing our marine life. So with good chance of seeing pilot whales, dusky dolphins, Commerson's dolphins. So if those outside decks are open, make sure you wrap up warm, get outside and enjoy it. Um, again, we've had orcas on the Drake's Passage as well. So a great time to start seeing stuff. Also, if the weather's good, we'll have our marine biologists on us on the outside decks doing surveys. We try and do a lot of citizen science. Oceanwide really do back this now. Um, we feel it's really important to give something back. Um, of course, we're going down to this pristine environment in this huge, great big ship. And a lot of us have a conscious moral dilemma here. Is it environmentally right? Should we be down here? What damage are we doing? And of course, they are really relevant questions and it's good that people are thinking like this now. So in return, we try and give a lot back to science. Our visits have to count. We need to give something back. So actually, as I said, a lot of our ornithologists, marine biologists will be out on deck doing surveys, which are really important when we're trying to learn about um, these creatures also ice and weather change, um, plastic pollution, all that sort of thing. So we'll try and engage this as much as possible with the passengers. We'll also give out our muck boots. These are fantastic. And don't worry, we have plenty on the ship. So don't worry about your sizes. I know people get very worried. Oh, am I a size six or a seven or 43 and 44? Doesn't matter, we'll try them on, we'll get you the right size. We always have spare. And these are the only boots that you will see the expedition staff in. And we really recommend you do the same. I know some people say, oh, can I bring my hiking boots? They're just not suitable for Antarctica. These boots are a godsend. I live in them. The only places they're not allowed are the restaurant and the bridge. Apart from that, you barely see me in anything else. They're super warm, they have great grip, and we can hike in them and all sorts. So these boots will be distributed on Drake's Passage. Of course, there'll be lots of lectures by the team. You'll get a meet and greet with us all as well. We'll talk about ice and penguins and all those relevant subjects. There's also what we call biosecurity, and that's when we bring the vacuum cleaners out and we get all the guests to bring up all their clothing and bags and we clean it. It's really important we don't take any um, species down to Antarctica from the mainland of South America or Europe that could start growing there. So what we'll do is we will Velcro the um, we will hoover the Velcro, we will clean all your equipment, we'll inspect it. It's one of the perks though, if you take the higher equipment that I mentioned earlier, because actually that stuff's all cleaned before it goes. So there's really very little to clean. Um, so this takes a few hours and it's always great to know who can use a hoover and who can't. Biosecurity is something we take very seriously as we head down to Peninsula. So even when we go ashore, there will be a lot of boot cleaning, a lot of um, cleaning of bags and tripods and stuff. It's important we leave this pristine environment as we found it and don't take any pests that could end up breeding here. What do we do here? Well, of course, the main aim is to try and get you off the ship as much as possible. So on the Plancis and the Ortilius, our two smaller motor ships, we tend to use these gangways, which are great for loading. And then in contrast, we have shell doors that we use mostly on the Hondius and most likely we'll be using on the Ansonius. 
And these are great for mobility. You almost just walk out into what these rubber boats, which we call Zodiacs. We spend a lot of time in these, both taking your shop and cruising in them. What I will stress is I know there's a lot of talk about boats over 100 passengers. Do you all go ashore? Yes, you do. Even on our bigger ships, we get everyone ashore. We don't believe people should be sat on the ship watching a movie or a film or being lectured to while other people are experiencing the wilderness. So what we tend to do both on our smaller and our larger ships is we'll divide you into two groups and half will go Zodiac cruising and half will go to the landing site and then you rotate. And there isn't one which is better than the other. They both offer very different experiences. So once we Zodiac cruise, we'll be looking for towering icebergs like this, which are incredible. We'll maybe cruise a glacial front such as this. And of course, look for lots of wildlife. And this is something which is very different. Many of you may have been up to the Arctic. And actually, I tell you, wildlife in Antarctica is very different to the Arctic. In fact, it's different to most places in the world. Um, it's super relaxed with you. And as guides, we will spend a lot of time telling you about the safe distance we're allowed to approach wildlife because there's a lot of rules and regulations for their safety. But actually, the wildlife in Antarctica knows nothing of those rules. And they often approach us and allow us to get exceptionally close and have these great personal encounters. Um, I have personally never been as close to a seal in the Arctic as I have in Antarctica on a regular basis. And why is that? Because actually up in the Arctic, of course, wildlife is still hunted primarily by polar bears. So every seal, when it's lying on an ice floe and hears a crack of ice, jumps in the water because it thinks it's a polar bear that made it. And of course, unfortunately, much wildlife is still hunted by the indigenous cultures up in the Arctic. So in Antarctica, they know no fear. So we have these great encounters with our seals, with our penguins, with our whales. So Zodiac cruising can give great wildlife opportunities. As I've already mentioned, whales will come and surface right by our zodiacs on numerous occasions. I'll be pointing out an iceberg which is particularly blue, and all of a sudden a humpback appears a meter from my zodiac. So honestly, really important you to have your cameras on these zodiac cruises. But if possible, make sure they're in waterproof bags. We will spend a lot of time on the sh um, zodiacs, so it's important you have dry bags with you. And of course, the weather can change really quickly in Antarctica, so we can go out in glorious blue sunshine. And within 15, 20 minutes, we may have 40 knots of wind and pouring with rain or hailstones. So you really need to be prepared clothing wise for all sorts of weather. But these little boats allow us to get exceptionally close to our wildlife. Of course, we will take you ashore. And this is where we'll often spend time at penguin colonies. Important to note here, the penguins have right away. You can see two gentoos here, they're in their highway. They're coming from their nest at the top of the hill down to the coastline, most probably, either to pick up some more pebbles or to feed. And actually, you just need to take a seat and watch the action around you. And often they'll come and approach you as well, which is absolutely fine. I've had penguins come and peck at my bag, at my boot, and that interaction is fabulous. So yes, take a seat, give them right away, and you'll really be surprised by their charismatic behavior. Sometimes the wildlife gets a bit bored of us, especially at those sites when we visit all the time. And you can see this little Weddell seal is like, oh, not another tourist group. Super relaxed with our presence. We'll sometimes take you to a site where there isn't any necessary wildlife. And that will maybe will be to go and do a hike or to go and do some snowshoeing. This is a place called Stony Point, which is just a big snow dome, but provides a good stretch of the legs. Um, what I will note with this picture is we don't provide walking poles. So if you do want them, please bring them with you. Um, and this sort of landing site gives us a good chance to go up to a vista, enjoy some fabulous views, and also do what we call an active and this we find really important because actually it's too easy to spend your whole time on your phone looking through the back of your camera and you don't just take in the moment. And actually there's always so much chatter on the landing sites, guides explaining what they're seeing, guests taking selfies, all that sort of stuff. But actually we encourage groups to go up to the top of the hill and just have two or three minutes of complete silence. No walking, no taking pictures, everyone just take a seat 
and listen to the ice crack around you. Listen to a distant whale blow. And actually, these couple of minutes are often a highlight of people's trip. Give some time to reflect where you are. It's such an overwhelming experience. It, the beauty is are something that will live with you forever. So we really do try and take you to these sites which allow this little distance, this little bit of solitude, a time to reflect on what's important. So I love these kinds of places. We'll also take you to historic huts such as this. This is Stonington, south of the circle. And this gives you another great perspective. You need to think that people actually lived in these huts. They have no proper central heating. They're just a wooden hut. And they weren't living in them just in the summer months. As tourists, we're all soft. We all go when it's 24 hour daylight and about zero to minus five degrees. These people lived in these huts when it's 24 hour darkness and it was minus 30, minus 40 with catabatic winds. That gives you a whole new perspective. When you're complaining about the dinner option on board or there's only one choice of cake at afternoon tea, think about the people that lived in these huts, these scientists, these researchers. It's fabulous. It's a real good look back in time. And actually many of these huts were just abandoned really quickly and we're often allowed to enter and you'll see the kitchen still stocked up, the shelves all with tins and jars of marmite and such like, the bed still made. So really great places to visit. We also try to take you to somewhere which gives you a bit more idea about the whaling and sealing history. This is Whalers Bay in Deception Island, which is an active volcano. Unfortunately, Antarctica went hand in hand with some of the big whaling and sealing atrocities that we did early in the 19th, 20th century. And actually that was within some of our big baleen whales lifetime. And I think this is really important to remember when you have a beautiful humpback come and approach your zodiac, remember that its mother, its grandmother was most likely boiled alive in these blubber ovens. It's really, really poignant how relaxed the wildlife is with us now, despite what we did down here. So another great insight. We will also take you, if we can, to an active um, scientific station. This is Base Brown, an Argentinian station, one of our favorites. It also provides a great stretch of the legs. You can see we're looking down over Paradise Harbor. So a nice place for a good walk, but a great place to speak to personnel. Also a chance to see what it's like living in Antarctica these days in the, doing science here. Um, if not always possible to speak to the personnel, they're obviously busy doing their research, but if they have got time, they're always really welcoming at these sites. This is um, Vanaski, a Ukrainian station that we love to visit. Um, they have a great gift shop inside and a great bar. And actually just on a personal note, they have a great tradition that if you leave your bra, you actually get a free shot of vodka. So ladies, maybe remember to take a spare bra with you if we visit this site. Um, and don't worry if you're not into science and you don't really want to speak to other people, there's usually a penguin colony at most of the sites we go to. So wildlife goes hand in hand with everything. And this is, of course, Port Lockroy, a site that many of you will have heard of, and it's the most southern post office. Um, it does feature in a lot of written itineraries, and of course, we do go there as much as we can. Um, but this is no guarantee, and that's something I really like to stress. So please don't come with a mound of postcards that you think you're going to send to Port Lockroy. Um, visits are very limited here, and in fact, it was chopped full of ice early last season. Um, so even the staff couldn't get in when they meant to and actually they were delayed and no one visited it for about a month because there was a huge amount of ice in front. Um, but yeah, Port Lockroy is a great site if we can visit it, but no, certainly not on every itinerary. And of course, we go back to having fun. I tell you, Antarctica brings the kid out in us all. Um, it's not uncommon to find 16, 70 year olds, if not older, to bogganing down the fresh snow, doing snow angels, making snowmen, and just generally enjoying themselves. And that's great to see. So what happens if the weather turns bad? Of course, we don't really like to talk about this, but you have to remember you're booking a trip to the most hostile environment in the world. The brochures, the, everything online will, tell, will show pictures of glorious sunshine. And of course that does happen and we have whole trips like that. But it's not always like this. And you have to bear that in mind. And as expedition leaders, we have to work hard to try and work with our captains to make the best of weather. And actually weather can be very localized in Antarctica. 
So if it's blowing 40, 50 knots of wind in one day, actually, if we sail in the opposite direction for an hour, hour and a half, we might have flat, calm conditions. So what can happen is that we can have too much swell at a landing site, that it's not safe to land our little Zodiac boats. There might be too much ice at a landing site that if even if we landed you, we might not be able to get you off. And however nice a landing site is, most people don't want to spend the overnight on it with no tent or any preparation, just stranded when catabatic winds come in. So as staff, we always have to think not only about getting you onto a site, but also getting you off a site. Um, there may be no visibility as well, and actually that's not safe. We can't be landing in thick fog. So lots of swell, lots of catabatic winds, ice, fog, all those sort of things can stop operations. But it's important to realize that plan B is not always worse than plan A. And actually there's lots of other options that we can do. Um, so don't worry if the dreaded announcement comes over the Tanai that your landing has been canceled. As a team, we will be working hard with the captain to try and make a plan B, plan C or plan D. One classic it was Christmas morning last year. Yeah, this is how I spent it. It will be a bit different this year, I tell you. Um, this is the famous Lair Channel. And actually, this was not plan A. We were meant to go to a landing site. Um, there was a huge amount of ice in front of it. The conditions were completely inaccessible. Um, so we decided to sail through the most picturesque part of this area, um, the Le Mer Channel, which was just stunning. Um, we crossed all the way through it and we headed south and we found a beautiful Delhi penguin colony that we hadn't found earlier on. So really, really fabulous conditions and a great plan B option. Also, if we're stuck on the ship, we'll often try and find whales. The whales don't care if it's blowing 40 knots of wind and there's too much swell. So actually, it's often that we can find great whale interaction when we're on the ship. And of course, we might find orcas. This again was a plan C or D option. We tried lots of different landing sites. Nothing was working. There was other ships around. It was busy. So we decided to head back up into the Gurlash Strait, where another ship had said that they'd seen orcas early on in the morning. All the staff went to the bridge with binoculars. And guess what? We had over 40 orcas following the ship, playing in the motion of the propeller around the back of the ship. Well, personally, that was much more exciting than going to another Gentoo penguin colony that was similar to the landing site that we'd done yesterday. So again, just bear in mind, if plan A doesn't work, we will have another plan for you, which will be great option. So what other activities on offer? I know lots of you will be active and want to do more than just go to a landing site, and that's great because Oceanwide offer a whole multitude of different activities. Some of you may have seen what we call our base camp trips. This is where for one price, you get a chance to do camping and kayaking and snowshoeing and photographic workshops and mountaineering, all just the one that is weather and I depend on um, plan A is that we get all guests to do all activities once um, for a fixed price. Um, otherwise, we do a regular Antarctica trip. And then some of our trips will have the additional option where you might be able to do a kayaking program for the whole entirety of the trip for a set extra. Um, there's no right or wrong as to which trip is right for you. It's just things to consider. Are you really wanting to do lots of activities? Or are you there to take photos, appreciate the wildlife, appreciate the landscape? Um, I would like to stress lots of people get very worried about what will I do if I'm not doing an activity? Well, actually, there's plenty to do ashore, which I've already spoken about. I spent five months in Antarctica last year. I didn't get into a kayak once. Unfortunately, I didn't get to camp once. I didn't go mountaineering once. Um, I did do a bit of snowshoeing and I obviously ran a few photographic workshops. But I tell you what, I had a very fulfilling five months. So don't worry if you're not doing a set activity. But let's have a look at what those activities involve. This is a little video that was made um, of a base camp trip last year. This is early season and obviously they were blessed with glorious weather. So I think everyone got to do everything. Um, we have made the decision to take off the audio just because it sometimes is a bit stilted in these webinars. But Franklin's going to send you links with the audio afterwards if you wish. Um, or you can just go online and find out the YouTube and hear what all the guests are saying. Um, but as it is, I'll just talk a little bit over it. You can see that they're still 
visiting our beautiful penguin colonies. And you can see the guy's putting on snowshoes. Gentoos just keep walking past. Great options of kayaking and mountaineering to be done. They were blessed with fabulous weather here. This is, I think the filmmaker must have been very happy. You can see it's early season again by the beautiful soft light. That wouldn't be a December, January trip. Paddling through Antarctica gives you a great experience. That silence you just don't get um, if you're in a motorboat. So it's brilliant to be at eye level with the wildlife. And you can see, even when they're not doing activities, still plenty of time ashore, still visiting those bases as well, those scientific bases. And plenty of time out on deck, enjoying the scenes. And a little bit of dancing in the evening as well. Lots of fun to be had. Just throwing those bivy bags ashore for camping nights. You can see the gentoos walking up and down in their little things. And they look like they've had a pretty good trip, don't they? Lots of smiling faces, I have to say. My goodness, if the weather was like that on every trip, our jobs would be so much easier. But yeah, very, very fortunate, fabulous weather. So that's what a base tramp trip can look like. And they are really good. If you are adventurous and you're wanting to do lots of activities, but you don't necessarily want a lot of time doing one particular activity, you're happy just to dip in and dip out and have a paddle just one morning, go for a quick mountain in, then this is probably the style of trip you should be booking. I'll just talk briefly about some of the activities we do in more detail. Yes, we do do this. This is the polar plunge. Um, we do our best facility on all Antarctic trips. Um, as you can see from this picture, um, we often have to do it from a rocky um, shoreline. So really do ask you to try and bring some footwear with you that might be waterproof if you do want to do a polar plunge. You need to get out of the water. Sarah, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Sarah, but we seem to have some sound issues. So we'll not sure if you can hear me, Sarah. We seem to have some some uh, network hitches. So maybe I will take over for uh, for a yeah. moment until. Uh, until we can hear you better. Maybe now, can you, is it synced yeah. again? Looks no, like it may have come. No, it's better. Perfect, I thought there was a syncing problem. Um, would you like me to repeat any of the mountaineering stuff or was that mostly heard? Maybe maybe last minute, if you can repeat the last minute, would be great. No great. problem at all. So just to go back to the snowshoeing, um, we do have snowshoes that fit everyone. Um, so don't worry about size, one fire size fits all. Snowshoeing is mostly done early season when there is a lot more virgin snow. Um, it's less likely we're going to get them out towards the end of the season because obviously the snow has melted a lot more and you're a lot more free to walk just in your muck boots. The mountaineering is a great option, but what I would ask is that you please take some time to really read those manuals that are in the pre-departure information. Um, it will talk about how the mountaineering light guides will divide up the groups. And this is really important. We've had a lot of guests in the past buy very expensive mountaineering boots, 
having not done any mountaineering before. And unfortunately, your boot type will not determine what group you're in. It will be based on your skill set and experience. So if you've never done any mountaineering before, you're most likely to be in one of the more beginner groups. Therefore, more basic footwear will be required. Obviously, if you're very experienced in mountaineering, you'll be put in one of the more advanced groups. And of course, the relevant footwear will be required. So please do take some time just to read the mountaineering brochure well before purchasing any unnecessary expensive footwear. Camping. This is a great option and an activity that always gets fully booked. Um, what I would like you to note here is how they're sleeping. They're not sleeping in tents. We now only do camping in what we call bivy bags. So we get you to dig a hole in the snow, which as staff we always joke is your grave. Just dig your grave for the night. And then we give you these really warm bivy bags to get into. And for us, there is no better option for camping in Antarctica. Why would you want to camp in a tent when you can see and hear nothing? If you wanted to camp in a tent, we do have a couple on the ship. You can take that to your cabin, put it up in your cabin, you'll have the same experience as going camping, which is chargeable. For camping in Antarctica, you need to be out in the elements. You need to be able to hear the birds flying, snow around you, See the beautiful night sky, hear the icebergs, hear the whales blow in the distance. Camping in bivy bags is the only option now, and it's fantastic. So really, really do take that as a consideration if you're booking one of the trips. It's always booked out, so don't rely on getting on a wait list on the ship. If you want to do it, book your place early. Kayaking, another great option, which is now appearing on more and more of our trips. We work to a one to 14 ratio. And as always, for safety, we have a safety boat with you. Again, this is a really unique experience. Being eye level with the wildlife on the water as penguins porpoise pass you, being able to approach small icebergs and feel the sounds, feel the motion of the water around you in that silence that you don't get on the zodiacs is incredible. So really great option for you. And we now offer diving. This is an activity that we're really starting to promote in Oceanwide. It's one that we've done for a long, long time, but due to demand and the fact that we're one of the very few operators that now offer it, we are gonna be adding it to more and more itineraries going forward. This requires a lot of experience in cold water dry suit diving. This is not diving for amateurs. I consider myself a relatively experienced diver, but I have no experience in dry suits and none in cold water. Therefore, would not consider this as an activity for myself. So please, again, really read the manual before trying to do this trip. Um, but this is a fantastic, unique option and one that we hope to do on more and more trips going forward. Of course, you can see all the divers smiling before they get into the icy frigid water. And this is what the moment of truth looks like. But our divers have had great experiences with whales and seals seeing big icebergs underneath the water because of course, much of any iceberg is actually below the surface and above. So really unique experience to try. But please remember again, if you're not doing an activity, you can just come and sit ashore with me and enjoy the wildlife, enjoy the ice. There's plenty to do, even if you're not doing one of these crazy add-on extras. So the very sad bit of the trip, unfortunately, disembarkation, and it comes around too quickly. So I really can't stress enough to really make the most of those 10 or 11 days. Don't worry about trying to get on dreaded social media. You can do all that once you've disembarked. Disembarkation tends to happen about eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, our day in port is very busy. We turn around and obviously getting more guests on at four. Um, but what we do ask is that you don't try and fly out too soon. Just as I said before your embarkation, if you can have an extra night in Ushuaia at the end, it's really advantageous. It's very unusual that we're ever delayed into port, but it does sometimes happen. If we have an incredibly bad dregs passage, we might be late into a port. So it's always worth having that extra night. You can always enjoy your shwire, help go out for a last few drinks with people that you've now made friends on on the ship. Um, after disembarkation, we will send you a few days later what we call the trip log. This is a big detailed document that the staff have been writing of your adventure 
during the trip. It has the GPS coordinates of every landing site. It talks about the weather, the, what the sea conditions, the visibility was. All our biographies are in it. You get the day-to-day -day program. So that will be the program that we put up in the ship each day, which will be plan A. And it's actually very interesting to see the difference between the plan A of the daily program and the plan B in the trip log of what we actually did. Um, plus of lots of other useful information. You really don't need to take too many notes during your trip. We do that for you. And that will be emailed out afterwards. Um, also, of course, we always want you to book another trip with us. And what I will say is Antarctica is not a once in a lifetime trip. If you do do an Antarctic Peninsula trip as your first trip, you're most likely going to want to come back and do Falklands and South Georgia or come try and find Emperor Penguins with us in the Red or Sea. Or if you really like the ship and it stays at sea, you may do one of our longer trips of 30 days, either the Ross Sea or the Odyssey. So I know it's always described as a once in a lifetime trip, but most likely you're going to come back and enjoy another one with us. And that's what we hope. So hopefully today I've talked a little bit about people's expectations and answered some of those questions you have. Um, unfortunately, we find ourselves in a time where COVID is paramount and health and safety is on everyone's point mind at the moment. And of course, that's the note we're going to leave you on today. So I'm going to pass back to Franklin who's just going to put your mind at ease about what we're doing as a company with regards to COVID-19 and how we're hoping to move forward and hopefully be sailing soon. Um, I hope to get back on the ship and be with our, my beloved penguins this time next year. So thank you very much for today and I pass you back to Franklin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, really great, great overview of all the Antarctic Peninsula options. Uh, now to conclude, I, I will give a short update on the current situation. I think we are all affected by travel restrictions and dreaming of future travels. Uh, well, at, at the moment, unfortunately, all of our vessels are in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but normally we will, uh, that's the plan anyway, restart operation as from Arctic season, so as from uh, June 21. Uh, now, of course, we have uh, new health and safety protocols, including temperature screenings, uh, upgraded cleaning measures and uh, air filtration te technology. But just as the, the knowledge of the virus itself, our protocols are not set in stone and we will continue to, uh, to evolve. So we will have communications about that as soon as the restart is planned. So. Um, Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for your expert uh, explanation. Really great overview and it helps to, to make a better choice. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm sorry for we had a few uh, sound uh, issues, but, uh, but overall it was, it was quite clear. So thank, for, thank you for staying with us. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact us or go to your travel agents and, uh, and uh, they will know how to reach us. Stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, hopefully see you on board of one of the vessels one of these days. Bye. Thank you.